States. It's my great pleasure to introduce you, Gary Slutkin. Um, I'm a medical doctor um, with absolutely no background in criminal justice. I'm a medical doctor, I'm an epidemiologist, I spend most of uh, my career working on epidemics um, such as tuberculosis and cholera and AIDS. I mean, most of that time with World Health Organization and most of that in uh, the developing world, in particular in Africa. The starting point for reconsidering um, the matter of violence is that there are really only two things in the history of humankind that have killed tens of millions to hundreds of millions of people. And these are the great infectious diseases which have largely slid into the past. I'm talking leprosy, cholera, typhus, typhoid, smallpox, plague, and violence and wars. These are the things that have um, overwhelmed us and our communities and our cities for the history of mankind. But somehow, we have overcome the first set mostly. But the reason for that has actually not been general progress. The actual reason for it is that they were scientifically discovered as to what was actually underlying them. At the times that people were undergoing plague and typhus epidemics, it was not considered that these would go into the past. It was considered that it was part of being human, part of our lot. And in fact, what else was going on was that while people were dying in these communities, other people didn't want to go there. And it was also the case that the people who had these problems were blamed. And it was additionally true that they were not only blamed, but they were set afire, thrown into wells, hung, and put into dungeons. Why was all this happening? Why, was, wh um, why were people with plague put into dungeons? It was because we didn't know what was really going on. It wasn't actual intentional meanness. It was not knowing what was going on. So why didn't we know what was going on? The reason is that it was invisible, what was going on. It was beyond our being able to see, and so we made assumptions about what was going on. And so, take plague. Plague was a bacteria, invisible, who knew about bacteria, inside a flea, inside a rat. Who knew? And so, with science, we were able to uncover some of this and then design very, very specific strategies to deal with um, these problems. So here is the, if you will, situation of a city that we know well that has what is, um, might very easily be considered the absolute spatial characteristics of epidemics. Geographic clustering. And this is a blow up of a west side neighborhood. The red bodies, deaths, and the black um, guns, uh, non-lethal events. So what would we do if we were to begin to look at this problem in a new way? And if we were to begin to say, um, yes, this problem is overwhelming us. Yes, people don't want to go into these neighborhoods. Yes, this problem is, is oppressing our mental health, our development, and so on. But uh, maybe this isn't entirely about the usual realm of good and bad. What am I talking about? Actually, there's no science of good and bad at all. So if you were to look at this from science, you'd say there is no good and bad. There actually is no right and wrong. In science, we just look at events as desirable events or outcomes or undesirable events or outcomes. And then we look at what are the predictors, what is underlying those events. So if we were to apply a scientific understanding rather than a judgmental one, what sciences would we apply? Two, principally, behavior and epidemics. Why? 
Well, violence is, I think most people would agree, a behavior. So what if we said that violence is only a behavior? like smoking behavior, or eating behavior, or exercise behavior, or sexual behavior, we'd say we'd have to be asking how our behaviors actually form, and specifically how are violent behaviors formed, and then how are they maintained, and then how are they changed. We need to know all of these things, and we'd have to look for what does the information, what does the research actually show. Let's start with this. Well, as it turns out, most behaviors, you may be surprised to know, are largely modeled. In other words, unconsciously copied. Copied, imitated, followed. And this is very efficient. It's, so, it's because this avoids, in evolution, the need for an instruction book on almost everything we do. We can just look to what those who are a little bit older or who are around us, what they're doing, and just follow. But we don't actually do this consciously, say, okay, that's what they're doing, I'm going to do it. It's actually neurologically programmed into something that's called mirror neurons, which are circuits that both observe and act, and it's unconscious, and it's invisible, and we model most of what we do. And then what locks it in is something that's called social pressure. And so we continue to watch and see what we think other people think we're supposed to do. And that becomes, and the research is very strong on this, the principal driver. So the principal driver of violent behavior actually is whether you think that someone in your peer group expects it of you, which you don't actually think through, but you're afraid to disobey that norm. So by um, comparison, I would tell you that in a room like this when I was in medical school, watching angiograms, a third of us were smoking. But now, none of you will light up. Why? Are the, is law enforcement here? Or is it because if one of you were to light up, the rest of you would say, what the heck are you doing? And so it turns out that the principal determinant of breastfeeding is with, whether we think the other moms are doing it. The principal determinant of whether someone uses a condom is whether you think your friends use a condom, believe it or not. And so likewise, in this, we learn what we think our friends expect of us. And then the thing can be escalated. And there's a whole bunch of social forces that then escalate it. And then this leads into the epidemic nature of the whole thing. Now, before proceeding into that, I want to pause then on the idea that what we are transitioning from in the modern world is the idea of this is actually learned behavior. Learned, not learning in school, but learning in the real world by this copying and imitating. And then there might be a new way of approaching it, which I'll get to soon, which has to do with interrupting events and unlearning. And this, which is also the conventional idea of the approach to this, turns out to both be um, highly overvalued and, in fact, also copied and counterproductive. Now, just a few words on the epidemic nature of it. These, on, on first glance, may look like the epidemic curves of infectious diseases. These are all violence epidemic curves. So if you were completely detached scientifically and just look at these curves on a page, any epidemiologist would see that this is epidemic nature or spreadable um, forces. This is, this is the killings in Rwanda, the massacres. This is a point source epidemic, very rapid in onset. I could superimpose on this a cholera curve in Somalia. Also with a secondary wave, very, very common in these circumstances. In Rwanda, hiding people being found in Somalia, new refugees um, being brought into camp and then being infected. And then there's other slower wave epidemics that show up that's more person to person. And you can see also that epidemics are made up of several epidemics. This is a cur these are curves of, of many US cities following the same pattern. And as it turns out, and I won't have time for this, the um, characteristics of every epidemic are seen in 
uh, violence epidemics in terms of infectivity, incubation periods, transmission characteristics, susceptibility, reactivations, and even vertical transmission from uh, adult to child with child reactivating later, which is what happens in TB and also happens with um, uh, teenagers. So is that good news or bad news? This is very good news because we know how to stop epidemics. And in brief then, what there are three things that we do, and we're not going to do the whole course, but we interrupt transmission, which means in a flu epidemic you may immunize, and that blocks the transmission. Measles, you may immunize. TB, you take someone infectious, make them non-infectious, they can't transmit. And what we do is we have now developed a new cadre of worker called the violence interrupter, who can detect and interrupt events and block one event from leading to another, leading to another, and so on. The second thing you do is you look for who else might transmit in the next few weeks or months. They may not be angry tonight, but they might in the next few weeks. There are certain characteristics, epidemiologic characteristics, that say, okay, well, these are the people who are going to get TB next. These are the people who might um, have violence next. And we know these characteristics. Some of it is hanging out in the same crowd, but there's other things that we use that are, are solid. And the last thing that you do is change the whole group norm. So the group norm here of smoking indoors has been shifted to not smoking indoors. The group norm in, for example, uh, Uganda's uh, um, AIDS program was perhaps five or six sexual partners. It was shifted down to maybe one and a half to two partners as normal. And so it's shifting the whole norm from violence is expected to less expected to expected to not be done. And so that's kind of the bottom line on it. And so what this looks like in terms of the um, graphics, blocking transmission, interrupters do that. Looking for the other people who might be in the same group. And then, and this is where we apply what we call ceasefire outreach workers. And they do long-term work, six months to two years, to change the thinking Similar to TB, you would be changing the sputum from infectious to non. We're changing the thinking. And so this is a second cadre of worker who will then do such identification and then make them less infectious, as it were. And there's a system behind this. You're beginning to see that this is a disease control system, not just a community activity. And then last, I'm changing the whole group norm with a certain propensity to violence to a lesser propensity. And so what, the way this looks on the ground is violence interrupters, very um, carefully selected for who they know, for their Rolodex, and for their abilities and desire to make change. And then they are trained through a training program, supervised, supported, they document their work. And in Chicago, for example, they have interrupted about 1,400 potential lethal events in the last four or five years, and a couple hundred this year already. There won't be a lot of time for to talking about how they detect and the whole system of how they interrupt, but they become skilled at it. And then the next group, the outreach workers, who work with the highest risk people, the others, they are doing behavior change work. They're talking with them through the day, they're talking with them about violence, and they're modeling new behaviors. There's role play here. So there's modeling occurring in the other direction, including practicing, anticipation of situation, avoidance of situation, etc. These are results of a study that show 85 to 97 percent effectiveness of the work of this program in um, helping people get into other paths in their life getting out of gangs or into school and so on, which is the second part of what the outreach worker does besides the behavior change work. And the third part, changing group norms. This is done in a similar way to the way norms are changed in many other fields of work. Multiple messengers, same message. Part of the work is having a response to every shoot, shooting, changing the thinking in the neighborhood from we can't do anything about it to we are changing it, changing the thinking of those involved from Nobody ever cares if we do it to these guys make a big deal of it. And then an accompanying public education campaign. And then there are specific roles having to do with bystanders, having to do with the clergy, 
and then the outreach workers and interrupters kind of lead on this as well. Now, I'm, um, very briefly, we're beginning already some work with Lincoln Schatz, who's here. Say hi, Lincoln. And uh, on a new um, social media um, uh, platform that helps us engage more, has um, using cameras and uh, the web, um, is an experimental activity. To, to try to go wider and broader and deeper on the norm change so that more people can get involved in the behavior change. So quickly, the results of this. First six communities in Chicago um, with three sets of controls. So this is scientifically assessed according to control groups, just like other scientific studies are done, showing statistically more substantial drops compared to three sets of controls, rate controls, neighboring controls, and so on. And then the next eight communities in Chicago, similarly, statistically uh, stronger reductions. And, though, and, and it showed up in all of the um, first 18 communities. This is another type of an analysis. It's called a hotspot map, densities of shootings, showing neighborhoods get it in a way safer, having less shootings. Um, over the last um, three years, um, a, an ex, a Department of Justice commissioned an external independent evaluation of the work using four different universities, four different statistical methods, documenting the reductions as seen, as attributable to the program, with very substantial um, drops. Um, one of the things I really like to emphasize is that these, the interrupters and outreach workers, there's a few of them here, actually succeeded in, in completely cutting off retaliations in five of eight neighborhoods. So um, we've gotten a lot of attention in the press, in part because of uh, the evaluation, but also because um, it's now established as evidence-based approach, and also um, because Chicago went from 600 to 450 killings in a year that we tripled. Granted, we've stayed stable since then. Um, this is, uh, we've been visited by over, I'd say, 40 cities now in the US. We're working with about 20. There's, there's 12 that are kind of actually getting going, 12 or 15, and about another 10 in the pipeline. And we're always doing trainings. I mean, people in this room have been involved in trainings with Philadelphia in setups with New Orleans, in um, visits to um, several New York City and New York State sites, and so on. It's, we're, it's a continuous training program um, in the US now. And then there's an international program that's developing. Um, the only sites in which we're actually um, in, in strong assessment and setup now is Trinidad and the southern um, area of Iraq, and most of these other sites we're in um, an engaging discussion um, as to the, the nature of the partnership. So this, these are our priorities. Um, they're simple. We, uh, the first one, which is the big one, is fundamentally shifting the thinking about this problem from whatever it was you previously thought that I won't even mention to something that is a sol solvable, that can be put in the past, that a new approach can be applied, and it's, it's now been demonstrated. We're, of course, doing replications. And then what we were talking about today in the course of the workshop is how to actually attach additional technology, methods to expanding reach, better detection, um, better, stronger behavior change going deeper. So I'll stop here. We'll pass on to the next speaker. Questions later. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you.